It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Nance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Backbone Planning Partners is a marketing name for registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Now let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host here, as always, Austin Peterson, coming to you live from our studio here in Tempe, Arizona. If this is the first time that you're listening to our lovely podcast and business radio program here, we are a small business podcast, meaning by small business for small business. Uh, My partner and I, Landon Mance, own a small uh, financial planning practice in Las Vegas and Scottsdale, Arizona. And we also come from a family of uh, a long line of entrepreneurs. And so we believe that it really runs uh, in our blood. And we believe that the small business community in our country is the backbone of the American economy. And so we decided to, to launch this podcast, Cinco de Mayo 2020, as an opportunity to prop up the small business community, give them an opportunity to tell their story, come in, share some advice, and and have a lot of fun along the way. So with that today, if you're watching this on video, you know that we're going to have fun based on the uh, suit coat that our guest, J.J. Levinsky, uh, president of Blue Wave General Contracting, is wearing today. So, J.J., welcome to the studio. Thank you. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. So, Blue Wave General Contracting, it's a commercial contracting firm. We'll get into that. But before we go into the business side of things, why don't we just back up a little bit? Tell us about you personally. Where did you grow up? Did you go to college? What did you study? Do you have a family? Do you have any children? Whatever you'd like us to know about you personally. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Fortunate to have grown up in a very humble part of Western Wisconsin, just just east of Minneapolis, um, 2,000 people. And it's funny because I tell everyone it was the perfect incubator for what I've turned into today. You're always in sports. You're always competing and just very humbled and blessed to, to, to know that I was brought up in that environment. And then went to state school, thought I wanted to be an architect. Um, after one semester, I knew that wasn't my calling. And luckily, I had a, a, a mentor at the time that said, hey, go into this construction management stuff. You'll love it. And the rest is history. And also, after undergrad, worked in the industry, went back, got into graduate school. And uh, I tell everyone that uh, graduate school finally taught me how to learn. Because I really, I never studied in high school or, or undergrad. It was kind of just memorization, regurgitation. Yeah. Let's be honest, you know, a lot of the problems with the educational system. But I, I enjoyed grad school. I never finished, but I, I got out of it what I wanted. And uh, that kind of set me on a different trajectory as I was kind of transcending through the industry. And I uh, was very fortunate to live and work all over the country and world in the construction space. So kind of went into that corporate world, came back into more of the smaller entrepreneurial world and quite honestly, never left Austin. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I tell you, so I didn't grow up in the Midwest, right, near Minneapolis, but I grew up outside of Salt Lake City, not as small of a town, but the way that you describe it is very similar to the way that I grew up. You know, I spent a fair amount of time on a farm as a kid. My grandfather was was the farmer and I I was there. My parents were divorced at a very young age. And so I spent a lot of time there learning important things. And then my dad was in the construction industry. My dad's a retired stucco contractor. And so my exposure to construction throughout my lifetime is is pretty high. I mean, I've spent uh, a lot of time with different subcontractors. I owned a construction company for a while, a residential and commercial painting company for a while. You know, it's something that I understand that I'm fascinated by. But my dad and my brothers kind of make because they're all kind of in that blue collar out there, get your hands dirty type of a of a job. And it's obviously not what I do. Um, so they make fun of me for that. Austin doesn't like to get his hands dirty, that sort of thing. But um, it, it's an industry that I have a massive amount of respect for. A lot of clients who are in the blue collar space, if you will, whether it's manufacturing or construction or industrial, whatever. But I don't know that there's a better place, whether it's farming or construction, to learn about the importance of hard work, period. Yeah, life skills 101. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have an MBA in life? <laughs> Hard knocks. You know, you always hear people talk about that. I look back at it and I, I'm thankful for every time that I got knocked down, beat up, picked yourself back up. 
because those same same friends that were knocking you down were the ones picking you up. That's how that's how we were raised, right? Yeah, and creates a tremendous lesson in life moving forward. And uh, then on the family side, a wonderful wife of 21 years, and and we have two sons, one in the Marine Corps and uh, one in uh, junior high. So uh, we moved to Arizona eight years ago and uh, quite honestly uh, love not having to shovel sunshine like every other (laughs) transplant here, right? (laughs) Exactly. I'm a a transplant. We've been here since 2014. So I think you got here a year before us. I tell my family that same thing. You don't shovel sunshine. You know, how do you deal with that heat? Listen, I don't shovel sunshine. So, you know, I can deal with the heat. It's going from the office to the car, to the house, to the pool, to the, you know, whatever. It, it just really doesn't affect me that much. But I do love being able to get out in the winter and still go out and run and, you know, take my, I took my dog for a walk this morning for a couple of miles. You know, it's, it's, it's a great place to live. We really enjoy it. And I don't, I don't miss the winters no. at all. Miss the people sometimes and some of the seasonal things, but no, I love it here. Yeah. Well, that's great. So your kids are also, it sounds like a little bit younger than mine. My oldest is 21. He'll be 22 in March. He's a, he's a junior at uh, Arizona state studying sports journalism. And then my youngest is is my daughter. She's 18 and she's a freshman at BYU, Idaho, up in Rexburg, Idaho. Oh, nice. So she's experiencing winter. (laughs) She's here now though. So she's, She's appreciating the warmer temperatures today, but uh, in a couple of weeks, she'll be back for, for the real winter in Rexburg. So I will, uh, I will see how she feels in a few weeks. Well, let's get into the, to the business side of things. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people are listening and they're thinking, okay, I know construction, you know, there's a lot of things that you can, you know, tell me about construction, but let's talk about the project that you're working on right now in the East Valley. But then, you know, we're essentially, we talked about this beforehand, we're going to let you kind of blow the minds of people that are listening and and understand that construction isn't the way that it's always been. And in the future is probably not going to be the way that it is today. And so we're, we're excited to have that conversation, but tell us first about this project that you're working on in the East Valley that many people may not even be aware of. So we were fortunate to partner and land a job uh, in the East Valley called the Cannon Beach Water Park. It's been very publicized, at least in the East Valley as kind of this eminent uh, surf lagoon, water park, things of that nature, and then the whole ancillary range of, of development around there. And we've, we're very humbled by it. And it's been just a true sense of camaraderie and how we pulled that together. And I think that was a kind of the essence and the kudos and the ethos of what Blue Wave stands for. And that's, if I can digress and go back to kind of the transformation of Wow, how is JJ here in in eight short years and really five short years? So the first two years I was here, I was in what I call the cleanup space doing M and A roll up type stuff as just a um, a business manager in the construction space just through my background. Very fortunate five years to, five years ago to meet my current partners, and at that time we were we had just done a, a different startup called School Builder. So we were predominantly just building in the charter school space, and what it was was it was the the last component of what I call a turnkey deliverable. So in the beginning, School Builder was just front-end development, entitlement, kind of maybe some capital solutions for the charter school space. And on the back end, the then partner at that time was into the bond financing, which those of you in the finance world understand how schools become solvent. They'll go back in for bond financing after three years and work the economics of that in the amortization schedule, if you want to call it that. So when I came in as a, as a partner or solution, early on five years ago, I was that last piece of making the the vertical piece go. So we, in essence, were that final piece that then we started building the buildings. And then this is where it gets interesting. We had a wonderful pivot and iteration, both in a failure and a success, which will then lead into your question. So we soon realized that um, to effectuate change, because we want, we just don't want to be another cog in the wheel in the construction space in in charter schools or whatever vertical there was. And at that time, we, we partnered with the CEO that my partner introduced us to, who was a brilliant man locally. And we went out and did a bunch of discovery in the space only to find out that we were probably five years too late to really doing something different within the charter school space as it related to capital construction and a holistic solution on the back end. So we had to s- kind of sit around the conference table and go, wow, we missed it. And you can either look at that as a failure or you can look at it as, okay, pick up the pieces and move forward back to well, how we talked about how we were raised, right? Yeah. Hey, get knocked down, get back up. And so luckily, uh, the CEO partner of ours 
he had tremendous influence in like the private equity wealth management world. And so we took that same model that we saw that we were trying to effectuate in the charter space and said, hey, maybe we can do this in these other verticals. And soon our phone was ringing off the hook to look at how we could d- develop this, this thing. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We were school builder at the time. We're now Blue Wave. The irony is, is as I was sitting in your lobby, I looked up at all the business books and here was the the precursor to our name, Blue Ocean Strategy, the book. And so everyone asked me, you know, how did you get your name? Well, it was at that point and at that pivot and iteration point when we knew that we wanted to not be myopic in the school space and that we could do this in other verticals that we came up with that name. And it just so happens that we had all read Blue Ocean Strategy and we were like, hey, this is kind of cool. And I'm not going to go into the explanation of Blue Ocean Strategy for those of you out there listening. Go pick up the book. Yeah. It'll, it's, a it'll, it's a little, yeah. it's a little carrot out there. Um, but it, it, it basically describes how we thought we could make a difference in the market space. And so with that, we developed the name Blue Wave. We, we just adapt, adopted to that. The spelling was, uh, we had to take the French spelling, EU, because all the domains and trademarks and everything that we wanted for social media and, and SEO were taken under the conventional spelling. It was a high risk at the time. And now I laugh because it was the biggest mistake of marketing we've ever made. <laughs> because it, half the people are like, hey, how, why do you spell your name the way it is? And what does it mean? Well, if you can tell your story, there's no better lead in, right? So anyway, that's, that's kind of how the whole thing developed. Well, when all those phone calls started coming in and without getting, getting to all the minutia, basically what we were trying to do was treat construction was our currency to create a holistic solution for people that had facilities-based needs. So imagine, I don't, we didn't define it by the vertical, uh, Austin. We looked at it as if capital and if the end user wanted something and it just so happens that the currency to get there was probably an, a facilities-based solution that had construction, we could monetize the construction in a way that was market fair. But more importantly, what could we solve in their front end, i.e. capital, real estate, entitlement, whatever. And then on the back end is how could we protect that asset? What asset classes were there? what returns were there, you know, everything from looking at cap rates to performance to IRRs to ROIs. Look, look at it from like a Wall Street person would instead of treating it like a construction person. They don't, they don't care about bricks and mortar. 90% of the people that hire us don't care. Right. That's what they hire us for. And our problem is our industry wants to barf on them and consume them with all of our problems. Take that away, right? So anyway, we started doing that. And uh, then we kind of hit a, a, a bump in the road because we were going after what I call too big a projects too early in our maturation cycle. And so we kind of failed. But again, now we're back to where we were five minutes ago again. Pick yourself up and go after it. So I went back strategically with Blue Wave back to the school space to kind of build back our cash flow reputation and, and do things. And so that sustained us for a while. Well, then it just so happens that by us planting those seeds and those holistic deliverables, the phone started ringing again around the valley to then prop us up to, wow, we were onto something earlier. It was just, we tried to eat the elephant all in one bite, right? Now we were back to eating it a little bit at a time. And so the Cannon Beach is a perfect collision, if you will, of how our story and our maturation matched a developer, a capital stack, and a group that wanted something bigger than just a general contracting solution. They wanted a partner that thought outside the box that could look at in it look at that project in totality and deliver something. And that's, I think, why we're sitting in here today. And I'm very proud of our team and how we've, how we've seen that and then delivered on it time and time again. And that's kind of where, that's kind of where we see our future and how do, how do we take that and even take it to an exponential level? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's obviously a lot to what you just said and the way that you guys are going to market with this solution, right? And we, we can get into the ins and outs if, if you want to, but you know, what I've found in really in any industry, I've definitely seen it in construction is there are a lot of firms out there that pay lip service to, we're not just a vendor for you. We want to be your partner. Right. But I think that they fall short 99.9% of the time in that because they truly are just a vendor. Tell us what you need us to build. We'll build it. This is what it's going to cost. Here's our fee for building it. Here's the timeline. And and that's it. It's not about the things that you just mentioned, helping them see 
the bigger picture? Have you thought about how you're going to come up with the capital for this? Have you thought about how you're going to monetize every square foot? Have you thought about how you should be pricing each of these square feet? And, you know, what should go in this portion of it, this portion, this portion, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it that it sounds like you guys are bringing to the table compared to JJ, here are the plans. This is what I want you to build for me. Tell me what it's going to cost me and how long it's going to take. I think the other key part of that, Austin, is try not to be a know-it-all in all those, all those areas. In other words, have the humility to bring the experts to the table when, when that piece is missing in, in your own thing. So I make, we make no illusions about we're not a one-stop shop that fits every need. But if you give me 10 minutes, we can call a bunch of people that can, we can bring to the table that might help you. It sounds so simple, but yet for some reason, there, there's so much ego and pride out in our, in our marketplace that some people aren't willing to give up that control, which I think is a travesty because you've just provided the whole, that solution for them. And it, it, fine, if everyone gets a little piece of the pie and the monetization of it, that, isn't that why we're in business anyway? Yeah. So I, I don't know why it is, but now as an old guy, it just seems so, so easy to see that. So we just try to consistently deliver on that message and then kind of take it to, to kind of the next level. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, that you're not the expert in, in every area, right? Because Landon and I will say that in our own business, you know, we're not an expert in each of these areas, mm -hmm. but we know enough to know when we're going beyond our own expertise and we have contacts or relationships with people who are experts that can go farther than we can personally go for you. Right. And, and I think that that's, a mistake that a lot of business owners make where they don't want to admit that they don't know what whoever they're talking to is asking them about. They don't know the answer and that they need to seek some additional expertise from somebody else. I think a great example right now, assuming that the predominant listener base is here in, in the Valley, is that make no illusion, our, uh, we're slammed right now, right? I'm, demand is outstripping supply for construction. And so I look back five years and maybe what I would call some of my competitors or even friendly competitors, we were still pretty close to the chest that we wanted all those leads and we wanted to take that and win every job. I can tell you it's not like that right now. Without mentioning names, there isn't a day that goes by that I'm not paying it forward on a referral to someone. Predominantly, I cannot tell you how many calls I get in the residential or like commercial space that we just can't deliver on. That's, that's on our market share and I can't be a yes to everyone. So we pay it forward much more than we say yes. It feels good. And I, you know, call me old fashioned and altruistic, but it seems like it comes back tenfold by just being a good person in that capacity. No, I, I agree. And I think that there's a lot of power in staying inside of your niche, right? Stay in your lane, bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I yell that every time I'm on the freeway, so I might as well, <laughs> might as well use it in every other aspect of my life, right? All right, so let's pivot a little bit and talk about some things that are going to kind of blow some people's minds. So, you know, everybody thinks construction's mundane, it's blue collar, it's throwing up walls, it's putting bricks, you know, it's it's laying bricks, it's whatever you want to, whatever you think of when you think of construction. But today, everybody, all you have to do is turn on the news and people are talking about blockchain and NFTs and, you know, crypto, all these sorts of things. So give us the JJ version of, of blockchain and crypto and NFTs. Well, I'll start off by talking about my own naivety and, and, and ignorance, even up till six months ago. As I was looking with the hyper growth in the valley, and I looked at how I was developing as a leader of Blue Wave and how we were developing as an organization and where we fit in in this community, I felt like there were gaps, like something was missing. The paradigm, as we all know, I mean, let me take a little tangent here, construction I'm, don't quote me on the facts, but let's say it's X percent of GDP in this country. And, and then not only on top of it, but I did see that, that real estate and construction combined is still the number one uh, contributor to, to GDP. Yet, when you look at the transformation and usage of technology and implementation, we're dead last. Dead last. Okay, so when all my peers and all my, my group talks about how we've transformed the industry, we haven't done anything. Okay, the Internet of Things was the biggest thing we had ever done. But let me tell you how that's become almost a negative. If you go and talk to, um, let's say I have a plumber that's um, an owner-operator. All he wants to do is have a good contract, be on a good job, that's clean, safe, and he can go make money, right? Well, we, our industry, we've inundated him and his group 
by getting 57 texts an hour because we use all these fancy applications that remind him that his RFI is submittal. You know, all these technical things that are in the construction space are due. We just took away his effective ability to do his job. He's a tradesman and a tradeswoman, okay? They just want to have the ability to get the work done with the plans and specifications and whatever deliverables they need to do their job effectively. We make that so complicated. We make that so complicated for them now because we want to be everything IT. But yet we're not using it efficiently and effectively. We're just using it to create more noise. So it was those things that were, were, was driving me nuts. So if you were to peel back the onion and look at the internal workings of Blue Wave, we took that away a long time ago. Everyone on our staff has ungodly experience in using all these different technologies from when we were raised and nurtured in corporate construction America. You get exposed to it, right? But we all had the same hangover, death by meeting, death by inundation of applications that aren't actually producing results. They're just creating more noise. So it was earlier this summer, Austin, where I started to really dive into the blockchain and go, here's been my answer the whole time. This could simplify the world that we're living in. Then as I peeled back that onion, of course, I went down the crypto path and I'm going to kind of steer clear of that in this conversation because there's a lot of subjectivity around it. But I, I will talk about how the DAOs and the NFTs and and the social tokens have a place in, in the future of our industry. But through that, I finally started to see how this could strip out layers and layers and layers of extraneous noise for everyone in our industry. And so that's when I started reaching out to the consultants, or let me rephrase that, insultants, because I believe consultants, <laughs> right? Consultants uh, are paid to t tell you what you want here. Insultants are, are true friends and colleagues that'll tell you, you're stupid, you're on the right path, this is good, this is bad, those kind of things. And then I started connecting all the dots, Austin. And for those of you out there that are listeners, I'm 50 years old and I'm just discovering this, but it was the final piece in my world that, I, that all the, the connections took place where I can now start to see how my industry and specifically me and our organization can have an effective transformation on the industry. Call it a legacy moment, whatever. But honestly, if we can just move the dial a little bit and kind of, you know, knock things up a little bit and ask people to ask more, or, you know, get people to ask more questions, then I think we'll have, have, have done that. So back to that, back to that plumber is just figure out a way to make his life simpler so he can then make money and do his trade to the best of his ability. So that's kind of how it all started. Now, if we go into different chapters, let me, I, I think a great way to, to, to visualize it for the listener is let me jump further to meta and 3.0, I don't know if anyone's been on your uh, podcast to talk about what Zuckerberg and everyone's doing in the, in the web 3.0 and the meta space. But I dream and I visualize one day of we're not, we're not making any more trades people in our industry, you know, and, and yet I have wonderful colleagues that they're investing all this time and money in trade schools and high schools and to do all those things. That's good. We need that too. But little guys like me, we don't have the capital to do that. We don't have the back backing. So I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking a different approach. Okay, let's look at the technologies and see how we can effectuate and change that. So imagine, and this kind of gets into some socioeconomic variables too. Imagine that a guy, a guy or gal, PhD or engineering degree in India that basically is on, by American standards is on poverty, but yet is brilliant at what he does. I'll just use a he for this example. Structural engineer, master welder, understands everything with rebar. Go to Web 3.0 where all these gaming kids and everyone, everyone's talking about how they're going to be interactive in virtual and augmented reality in the future. But imagine that that engineer has his Oculus on in Mumbai, and I have a immigrant person that can barely speak English here in the States on a job, and they're getting ready for concrete forms is a great example. And he doesn't know how to tie off the rebar that's specifically designed for this crazy engineering schematic that's in front of him. Imagine that guy has the Oculus on over there and the other guy in this end has the Oculus on there and they can digitally transform this together. And then the digital interpretation between whatever language he's speaking and whatever the native tongue of this labor is, that's profound, Austin. Yeah, it is. Those are the kind of things that I, before I go in the dirt in my industry, I want to see happen. And I don't think it's that far away. I think a good example locally and without getting too political here was what Katera tried to do. You know, I'm not going to make any judgments about where, what happened beyond that, but look at how they tra tried to transform the industry. There were wonderful ideas there. 
So as far as taking things modular, taking things and, and cutting out middlemen, and it wasn't to cut out the middlemen, it was to beat inflation and beat all these supply chain issues and all these things. If we're not going to solve these problems from a solution-based standpoint, then we're just contributing to them more and more. So anyway, going back to that, that meta on 3.0, I could give probably 30 more examples of how that could work in our industry long term. But you can see the remote nature. I mean, you and I were actually at another deal where, remember, that guy was talking about near, um, near shoring and onshoring because of the specific need. Yeah. Yet, I think this could be a solution to the following the sun type thing. Because in the construction space, it's, it's not as subjective. It's a lot more objective to where if that engineer picks it up, it's standards, right? And it could even be done digitally. So now we can take that one step further. Let's go back to where all that digital is then backed up in the blockchain versus all these proprietary systems that never talk. So I, I, I distill it all back to what the blockchain provides, and that is smart contracts, all the, all the digital and algorithmic backgrounds to all these things that are math-based. Let's be honest, construction is 90-some percent math-based that's applied through a craft. So I still think that the, this is the solution going forward. Now, going down the, the tangential pieces of the funding, you know, like what, what, how are NFTs and DAOs and the different tokens going to be used? Take that same example back to the, 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 the structural guy in India. Again, take currencies out of here. In the future, could he on the blockchain or some, or let's, you know, whether it was the DAO or the DeFi, if for those listeners that don't know what DeFi is, maybe write it down and look it up. And DAO is D-A-O. It's not D-O-W. It's D-A-O. And look at how these things are all interactive. They're very simple when you look at it in context. Again, if a 50-year-old guy like me can figure it out, all the people younger than me, you guys should be speaking this language fluently. The other thing I found out is that, two what is it, 2% of the general population even understands what an NFT is right now, or DAOs or DeFi's or any of that kind of space. I don't think it's going to change. I think it's here to stay. The volatility of the crypto, that's a whole other topic that you can get on with, an, with another expert. But as far as the construction space, I see that that person, what it does is it takes away everything that they stand for in the decentralized command. So that person now can think of it as a 1099. They're sitting out there in space. They have value. They have expertise. They can now monetize themselves in the global market and be connected through, maybe not through the DAO, but through a DeFi where they are now getting paid through a token, a coin, or a social token for their services to contribute to a, an output that solves a solution in the construction space. So imagine in a construction job site where everything was local and all those contracts were written old-fashioned style, you know, paper, email, all those kind of things. Imagine that all in the blockchain. Now imagine that the labors are still local but that all the consultants, engineers, and anyone contributing to the solutions can now truly be global. And that's all done, that could all be done through the blockchain. It could all be monetized and exchanged through all those different, different, call it intermediary type, type means and methods. But then all of it is then backed up digitally on the blockchain as well, as far as here's your solution. Here's your end game. Here's how it's recorded. So I know that was a high overview, Austin, but I think we could, um, maybe take a departure here and you can ask me some questions because I have some other ideas about how this could then fill some of the voids that we're seeing locally. And, and one of the best examples is regulatory agencies. And, but let's take a little moment and you ask me some questions and I'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've definitely got some comments and some questions. Let's take a break for a quick second. We're going to play a call to action for our audience and then we'll come back and discuss this further. Hey there, Tycoons. Austin Peterson here, co-host of Tycoons of Small Biz. If you think you have what it takes to be considered a tycoon and you're wondering how you could become a featured guest, please follow and then message us at Tycoons of Small Biz on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if it is a mutually good fit. And if so, we'll get you scheduled for an interview. If you're unsure about being a guest on our podcast, but are contemplating selling your business over the next few years and you'd like to know what your business is worth, Please also follow us and then message us on LinkedIn for your no obligation, informal valuation of your business. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening to the Tycoons of Small Biz podcast. And now back to today's program. All right, Tycoons, we're back here in studio with JJ Levinsky of Blue Wave General Contracting. And uh, if you're just tuning in, you may be a little bit surprised that we're not talking about 
you know, a whole lot of construction related, or at least the way that you may view construction. We're not talking about concrete forms and bricks and foundations and basements and all those sorts of things that you think uh, we would talk about uh, with a construction company owner. But we've been talking a lot about technology and kind of what the future uh, is bringing to the table here. So I'm going to back up a little bit, JJ. And, and you know, when I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that I owned a, a residential and commercial painting co- uh, contracting company, probably 2005 to 2008-ish, really right when the residential market blew up is uh, is kind of when we got stuck there. But I remember people being blown away with the technology that I was utilizing in my business. And that was nothing more than a, an Excel spreadsheet to generate bids and estimates, right? Because he, here's the thing. So I was seen as technology forward at that point because I was carrying a laptop and going in and I was using a laser measurer and I was putting, you know, these, these measurements in this spreadsheet and it was, it was able to give them an estimate right then, right? We're talking about a lot further from that, but here's the thing. I had my house on the outside of my house painted a year ago Mm -hmm. and literally the guy walked around, looked, looked and gave me a price. Yep. Right. And so that kind of stuff is still happening today in the construction world. What you're talking about is such a huge departure from that, which I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, it makes 100 percent sense to me that you can have an engineer in Mumbai with that Oculus. I've got one of those at my house and I'll play games with it or exercise or whatever. But being able to use that technology on a day to day basis to get the best talent and maybe even the cheapest talent, right? Because it's still going to cost us less to use that talent than have somebody here on the construction site telling that person that's setting the concrete forms how to tie off the rebar and all those sorts of things. But it's giving opportunity to people in other countries and creating truly that metaverse that Mark Zuckerberg is envisioning, right? I mean, I think it's easy for us to to say... (sighs) that dude is crazy. You're changing from Facebook to Meta after how many years and you're completely changing your business. The reality is he's on to something and this truly is the future. So I I think that it's interesting to have this conversation and realize in real world terms, in something that people understand rather than I'm not sure what the metaverse is, or I have no idea what a DAO is, or wait, blockchain. I thought blockchain was just Bitcoin, like not even being able to delineate or differentiate between blockchain and crypto is is the way that most of the population in our country is today. Right. Less than 5% easily. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's yeah, you, you said it earlier, like we could have somebody come in and talk about crypto and the marketplace for crypto and the, you know, all that kind of stuff that, ha- that has, that has its place and it's important to discuss and for people to understand, but the blockchain and how data is stored and how we have the ability to pay people in other countries. And, you know, there's still a lot that has to be figured out, but why not? Right? Like why, why doesn't this make sense for well, construction in any other industry? What it for the reason I got here, Austin, to this pivot point in my life and understanding and why it all kind of came together was, I looked at my own encumbrances. So me growing a business, like I, I hit a bonding capacity because I grew too fast. Okay. So without going into details, there's all sorts of ways to go around that. But in this world, technically, if I leverage blockchain to its truest T where all these things were put in place, would it 100% take away uh, a lender or someone requiring bonding? Maybe not, but you're taking a lot of risk off the table. Um, I'm conservatively estimating that if I'm representing capital and let's be honest, that's how everything works, right? I mean, money usually starts something and that's, we want to return out of it. Even if it's nonprofit, there's still, that has to take place. So we always get the question, well, geez, construction, why are you guys so expensive? You're going up and up and up in price. Well, it's because you, meaning you capital, you underwriting, you bonding, you know, and I'm going to get some people upset with me on this call, but that's fine. (laughs) We have to add all that into the cost of the construction, COGS, you know, it, it's, it's, yep. it goes right on uh, your COGS. And so a lot of this answers those questions and it takes the human element out of it, not for a bad reason, for a better reason. It's, it's letting math talk to math, computers talk to computers. If you understand the simplicity of blockchain, we're just taking out subjectivity and perceived risk when let the math determine if there's risk or not. Right, Austin? Yeah. 
So I just, I love what it, what it does of creating kind of a new baseline, a new paradigm of how, how do we go forward? And then how do we manage all those other things? Well, that, that's, that's a lot of the other uh, piece of this. Let me go, but you, you bring up this, this is a great segue into, um, for those of you in the Valley that uh, understand construction, a lot of times we have to submit to a municipality. Okay. And the other problem they have is they don't have enough people right now to process all these plans, all these submittals, all these things. Can you imagine if we took away all that human, again, oversight, this, that, and thing, and we could digitize it all? Well, guess what? Most of it already is digitized. It's just nothing knows how to read it. Yeah. And nothing knows how to read it and then interpret it back into data that goes out the other way. That, in essence, if you can visualize this listener base, that's what we're talking about where blockchain could solve problems. So now put yourself in the municipality's seat. Well, geez, we're going to give up the revenue. No, the developer and the capital people don't care. Okay, they're willing to still pay the permit fees and the permit review. They just want it done faster. Yep. So everyone wins. The tax base wins because they're still getting, you know, that developer is paying the taxes and the fees to get this done to make sure it's being done correctly. We're not talking about cir- circumventing any rules or regulations here. Speed, speed kills. So let's let's just help speed this up. Take away a bunch of um, centralized command control that doesn't add value and then give that to the marketplace. And that in essence is kind of what it is. It's decentralized command. And when you peel back the onion on DAOs, you know, blockchain and all these things, that's, if I was to give a common denominator for the lay person and the listener that doesn't understand anything, that's the biggest message here is it's decentralized command where you, the user, you own as much of the equity as anyone else. Sometimes hard to comprehend, but once you get that, comprehension of it, it opens up a whole new world of how you see all this interaction in this space. Yeah. So to make sure our listeners understand and and really quite honestly, to make sure I understood exactly what you were meaning there, if we're if we go back to the idea of submitting plans to the municipality. Right. Right. Whatever it is, you've got to submit, you've got to submit the application, the plans, all that kind of stuff. And what the city is concerned about is does it meet our requirements? Yeah, right? Codes. Yeah. Uh, statutes, lim- you know, whatever's written in the bylaws. Right. So essentially what happens in the blockchain is the municipality has uploaded to the blockchain the requirements. You're uploading your information to the blockchain as well. And those things are speaking to each other to verify that it actually meets Correct. the guidelines. In a digital language. Rather- yeah, it's right. all converted to digital language. Right. Yeah, coding. Rather right. than an individual reading it right. and looking at the plans themselves to see if it fits. No. A safety measure that still goes across a human's eyes, but by and large, 95% of it has already been vetted. But now again, back to capital or developer or anyone in the real estate space, they feel like, wow, it's not sitting on, because, part, you know, because Bob had to take his two-week vacation at the end of the month because he had accrued it. Now my plans are sitting on his desk. Well, what's the carry of the interest on 20 million for those two weeks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? Yep. So it simplifies things, but I think, it's again, it's it's the paradigm and us as a society understanding this, it's not scary, okay? It's just technology can be good. And like you said with Mark on the 3.0, he might be doing some things that are crazy, but he, I'm not advocating for him. I'm just saying the the metaverse, there's some cool things coming out of there that I see as wonderful ways to make sure that our industry will have continued support of having, a, you know, it's a, it's a great entry level industry to get people to start a craft, to learn something, to make a living and be proud of it. Now you don't have to go through all the old traditional schools and maturation of 15 years to become a master of this. With Oculus, you could, you, you can be on your own fast track if you have the initiative. Now you have the tools, not for free, but almost for free. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about because we're not recruiting any new, we, we're not recruiting enough people in our industry to sustain what we have to deliver on in the next 20 years. Yeah. This, these kind of tools are things that I've looked at going, you better embrace this, JJ, because this is the future. If you want to be one of those old grumpy curmudgeons that dies with your craft, then stay over here. But I choose to go over here and I'm excited about it. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I mean, you alluded to this earlier that there's, there's, it's not just embracing and using technology in the right way, but there is a big shortage in our country of people who are willing to, to do the blue collar jobs, right? And so it's, it's another way to, I guess, maybe entice people 
who didn't think that they would be interested in that to realize, gosh, this could be an exciting career opportunity as well. And well, and it's become techie now for him too. Yeah. I mean, I look at my youngest child and it's like, you know, I'm not a gamer, but he's a gamer. He, he could, how, how proud would I be as a construction guy if he took gaming and combined it with construction? And I'm like, wow, I'm proud of you, son. Yeah. I mean, we're all, you know, it's a little sentimental there, but it's, it's not beneath, you know, that isn't a look down upon trade anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sure. now it has value, perceived value. Yeah. And, that, and that's the other thing is that back into where blockchain goes into all those social tokens and the NFTs and the DAOs and things like that and the DeFi is if you're a producer, a contributor, as they call it, Austin, in the new, in the, are you a contributor economy or an influencer economy? So an influencer, again, is control. You control, 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 and you influence, influence, influence. The paradigm that we've existed in in a long time. Now, in today's world in blockchain, if you have value in your contributions, the market will tell you what they're willing to pay you. And paying now is different. Paying is either through coin tokens, you know, those kind of things. But it has a much more communal and community effect. So if you're good in a community, you basically are raising your own stakes and dividends, whether you know it or not. And I think that's the beauty because now there's no barrier to entry. You can monetize yourself or let the, the capital side within the blockchain, let it drive your own perceived value. So if you're a producer and a contributor, guess what? Your value goes up. I mean, I think a lot of people just want meritocracy, right? They just want to be, have the ability and the knowledge and the skills and the tools to get there. Oh, is this a cure-all? No, but it gives a lot more tools and a lot more steps to let anyone get there on their own accord. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that, you know, I mean, we could, <laughs> it, it, it's not that blockchain and DAOs and all this will solve all of the issues that we have in our, in our country of equality and, you know, opportunity, equal opportunity, all those sorts of things. Cause that's still, you know, going to be a concern, but I can see how it would, how it would help and how, if it were deployed in the right ways, it could, it could make that possible. So a couple of things that I just, I wanted to mention one on the, on the blue collar thing. So yes. we had a guest, actually the very first guest that we had on, on the program was the author of a book called blue is the new white. His name is Josh Zolan, owns a company here uh, called Windy City Equipment Repair and Services, and and they do restaurant equipment repair and, and installation and sales, right? But he's a young guy. He's 30-ish, 35-ish, somewhere around there, pretty young guy, and, and just kind of fell into this business because his dad fell into this business. Like, it, it they have a really cool story. The dad was actually a, a stuntman in Hollywood. And then, and he got hurt and he needed to do something else. And, you know, he was looking for a job and ended up fixing some guy's oven and realized that he made more fixing that guy's oven than he had made in a week working for somebody else. And that's really how the, the company got started, right? And then the son followed in dad's footsteps and went and became a, a Hollywood stuntman and, and wasn't making enough money to raise his young family and came back and started working for dad and worked his way up and, and now runs the company. Really cool, really, really, really cool guys, and uh, and the book's great. So if you're even thinking about being in a blue collar job or looking and considering it, you should look at Blue as the New White. The real thing that it really led me to think of is you were talking about Blue Ocean Strategy. You know, we're talking about technology. I just started re-listening on Audible to Jim Collins' Good to Great. Great book. I mean, it's definitely one that you read or listen to multiple times. So I was listening to it walking my dog this morning. And, and one of the things that he says in the early chapters is that technology is never what pushes a company from good to great, right? Technology is a tool. And if you use it correctly, it can help, but it's not going to be the major driving force from taking a company from good to great. So what would your response be to that in terms of construction overall or running a business? You know, what is it that you guys are doing specifically inside of Blue Wave and, and looking towards the future? Great question. And by the way, I love love that book. Probably read it three or four times myself, or at least audio book. Just from my own lumps and bumps and bruises, it's find that passion and go for it. Like you said, technology is just another tool. So everything we've talked about right now is just a tool to help drive what predominantly is my belief, but also I know that our team also believes a lot of what I've been doing because otherwise they wouldn't have joined. They, they didn't want to be another cog in the construction wheel. They wanted to see what they could do. And a lot of them have a blue-collar background. But, again, they didn't want to get sucked in the white-collar noise, 
right? Yeah. So, and you, you were talking, I mean, let's be honest, blue collar jobs right now pay higher than white collar and they don't have the debt service of a four-year college yeah. or, or a Tommy boy plan, <laughs> <laughs> if we want to call it that. So yeah, the, the, the paradigm is also switched there, but yeah, the belief of in yourself of what you, what you're trying to do and your connection. I think the biggest thing that I've learned lately is just the connectivity of your clients, your employees, your, your whole ecosystem. I, I tend to, when I get into the ultra focus mode, I get out of that. And now having people make me aware that that is so important. Um, it's kind of cool. It's, it's humbling for me, but I see how it has such a, a great impact on what you were asking is how do you then take that to market? And on that, it's let them value you and tell you versus you trying to pound your value down their throats, right? Yep. If you have what it takes, you'll find out soon enough. And if not, I, call, I ask you to do what a lot of us have done when we get knocked down, get back up, which we've talked about three or four times already today, reassess and find out, is, you, is this your true north, right? Is this your compass? And if you stay on that, you'd be amazed how well your, your, your business and your life and your, your combination of the two work out. So I hope that answers a little bit of your question. I know that was a little bit tangential, but I got back to the front door eventually. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job. You got there. The, the, it, really, it comes down to leadership, right? And in, in the book early on, it talks about level five leadership. And that's kind of the first, you know, core principle that's, that's taught in taking these companies from, from good to great. But level five leadership really just means that you're, you're taking things to a different level than another leader. And some of that is, like you said, it's listening to the people that you've hired, right? I mean, hire good people and let them tell you what you should do, not hire good people and tell them what to do. Right. And, and you've got to have, you know, it's not just about your people being your most important asset, but it's, your best people being your most important asset and making sure that they're empowered to do what you hired them for. And if you don't have somebody who can do that, then you probably do have the wrong people. But the last thing that a leader should do is step in the way of somebody else that they've hired and tell them what to do if they have more experience than they do. You hired them for a reason, let them do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, another thing uh, early on, if we go back to some of the earlier questions you were asking me, I just realized that Another important thing that we've seen the market share ask us is how, take ownership. You know, instead of being a vendor, like you were talking, are yeah. you just a vendor? So in that ownership thing, we always bring up the word equity. Yeah. But I don't know if we've necessarily thought about equity in the new equity terms, Austin. So let me take, take a moment to talk about how I see this transforming a little bit, how we tie it to blockchain, but more importantly, just in its infant state right now in short term. And that is... As a, as a general contractor, I get all, asked all the time, like, oh, what are you willing to put in for skin in the game here? Okay, so we've actively started saying we will. Now, in, in, again, in today's world, that's just money or defer your fee to take an equity position and hold co or what, whoever you're working for, right? Yeah. And that's, that's easily done in the business world. And it, but it makes them feel good because now they don't, it's, it's not a transaction. Now my GC is now my partner and they're going to look out for things. And it's also, it's almost like a subconscious thing where they don't think you're going to screw them now because, you know, our industry has a tor terrible reputation of, oh, they're just going to bid it low and change order me to death. Okay, yeah. well, we could go down that forever. <laughs> but now when I look at it in the, in the blockchain environment and back to the tokens and stuff like that, I think you can now define that equity in the community base. So I'll, I'll give you a great example back to the Cannon Beach water park. I was naive to what kind of person would be using that water park once we get it done because it's really not a water park it's more of a surf lagoon yeah. it's tailored more to the active sports person than someone going and laying in a beach you know thing and drinking a beer it's really not like that yeah but once i saw the, the the demographic of that group and started watching what was happening on social media i realized like these people are passionate and they're global so i started thinking like how how would this next park be done in jj's version of what i just described earlier so let me take the listener through this. Imagine that the, the original capital or the original equity is what it is. There might be a, a large investor, one or two that have some wealth, but now they create a blockchain community, which in, let's call that a DAO right now, um, or, you know, in the DeFi space, they create a DAO, which is basically you contribute, you're part of this ecosystem, a decentralized command that now would raise the money, use crowdsourcing, for example, another 
let's interject another piece of what's yeah. going on in the world right now. And now you take down this piece of property in Australia. Let's use that as an example. And then from there, now all those people feel like they're part of that equity, that community. And now back to our creator versus influencer, now they have creator contributions to this that's building the perceived equity of that total build out of, of that tangible water slash surf lagoon, but also all the inherent things that come out of that that make them tick. The action, the excitement, the friendship, the the collegial experience, the this, the traveling, the adventure, you know, all those things that come that influence our right brain versus our left brain type decision making. And then at the end, it's all being, this is all done through smart contracts on the blockchain. So I know that was a quick example of how we take equity now of taking ownership so we have more community-based things to how that looks in the future, both in a uh, in kind of a hypothetical project. But I wanted to make the listener aware that it's not just about that. It's about think of yourself of what communities would you like to be in? You know, what's important to you, Austin? You know, like if you're a hiker, um, what what makes you tick outside of of work that you could combine your work with contributing to your community as a hiker or as a passionate golfer or as a philanthropist? The biggest takeaway I'm seeing as I'm exploring all these spaces based on blockchain is how impactful that community tagline is. And I'm using my air quotes right now. I was humbled to see how important that is to many people in society. And now that I understand that, I'm understanding, don't sell that, but give them tools so that they can, they can then double down on that because that's what drives people. Oh, it just so happens now you got a return on investment as well. Yeah. Don't think money. Think, are your deposits, your intellectual deposits as a creator, are you getting more out of it than what you put into it? And that's been the humbling part for me as an old guy to see how the younger generations, that's very, very important to them. So let's build a bigger ecosystem so they can contribute to that. And then using the technologies we talked about today, we can deliver on that result. Does that help make, does that kind of make sense, Austin? Yeah, no, it makes a, a ton of sense. And, you know, you said it's, you know, the intellectual con- contribution, but the financial side is actually very true too, right? I mean, you he, you turn on the news and you talk about how the rich just, all you hear is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And, you know, you don't have equal opportunity to participate in this, but with the blockchain and with these, you know, crypto type coins and tokens and all those that are out there, you could technically get in as a very small investor without having to, you know, the minimum of $500,000 to get in or minimum of a million to get in, all of a sudden you got somebody who's got a hundred bucks and can put in a hundred bucks every two weeks and contribute to whatever it is that you're talking about, building another Cannon Beach, you know, park or whatever. Then all of a sudden you do have truly equal opportunity at wealth to participate in these types of projects, which I think could be really cool. So anyway, that was kind of just, I just wanted to put it in context with that surf park because I thought it was a great example of how looking at uh, how important the community aspect was to those people that love to surf and how global they are that that they could do something like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, we uh, believe it or not, we've gone almost a full hour, so we're, we're kind of up against it here. But I'm going to leave it with you, JJ, to let our listeners know anything else that they need to know. How do they get a hold of JJ? How do they get a hold of Blue Wave Consulting? What would you like our listeners to know uh, they don't already know? G- great question. So, um bluewave.com that's b l e u w a v e and or jj levinsky i'm all over linkedin and that's the best spot to get at me naturally it goes to all the other social media platforms but i i play there and then i let my smart people make sure that it gets disseminated everywhere else we're local i love to i love to talk and meet about these kind of things um i actually was introduced to you austin through other networking groups and things like that so i'm still passionate about how we can do these things within our own community first and then and take it out. But very accessible for anyone that wants to open up the dialogue on, yeah. th- on this or even just old, old school construction. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, the, the funny thing about Phoenix is if, if you're not listening, or I mean, if you're here, but <laughs> excuse me, if you're listening, but you're not here in Phoenix and you don't know this, Phoenix is really the, the biggest small city in the, in the country. I mean, it's all about small business here in Phoenix, and it, it truly is the hub of, of small business in the country. So we appreciate you being here. I've really appreciated the conversation. I've learned some things along the way and definitely some things that I didn't expect to learn along the way. So appreciate the conversation, JJ. Appreciate the invitation, Austin.
You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.